Old Brooklyn Christian Church, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recover of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed old brooklyn christian church amen i'd like to welcome everyone to old brooklyn christian church today's message is gospel wit grit amen gospel wit grit and you might be thinking i'm talking ebonics and slang but i'm not folks it's a message here and every word is important i want to talk to you about gospel wit grit okay right now you have a gospel that is not with grit you got a gospel that's with fruity pebbles you got a gospel that's with fruit loops you got a, a gospel that's with lucky charms you got all types of gospel but it ain't a gospel with grit how many of you know if you eat grits anyone ever had grits before grits have a high source in what fiber if you eat grits, they have a, uh, they're called grits because they're gritty. And uh, gritty things have fiber in them, and that fiber helps to digest the food. Amen? But I'm not talking about grits today. Amen? I Amen. But not too much butter and not too much salt and not too much sugar. So there's a balance to it. Amen? Amen? So I want to talk to you about gospel wit grit. Wit means a mental sharpness, a mental sharpness, a keen intelligence. Amen. How many know as Christians, we're not called to run around as uh, witless people, as uh, bumbling idiots and baboons. We're called to be witty. In fact, the Bible says that there is a witty invention that's given by God, and we are called to have wit, but not wit of this world, wit that is given by God. Amen. Amen. And then, I want to talk to you about a gospel, not just wit, wit. I want to talk to you about a gospel, wit, grit. Amen? Grit is loose particles of stone or sand, right? If you work with wood and you, you see that this pulpit was handmade, this did not just appear like this by uh, God. It just, God didn't grow a pulpit out of the ground. It started off as a tree, and they had to cut that tree and get it into a place where it was close, and after that, they had to get what? They had to get some grit. They had to get some sandpaper to smooth it down. How many of you know that we need a gospel with grit that will knock out the rough edges in our life? that will uh, uh, smooth us down a little bit because some of us are rough around the edges, amen? And we need some grit to rub against us so that we can polish and that we can shine the way that God intended, amen? Gospel, what grit means loose particles of stone or sand, courage. How many know God is looking for Christians that have courage? How many know God really can't even use us if we don't have courage? Because the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and sound mind. That's why I want to talk to you about the gospel wit, grit. Amen? Grit means courage. It also means to resolve. How many know if you have the gospel, God will give you resolve in your life? You'll be able to resolve problems that you could not normally do without God. Amen? Jesus Christ is going to resolve problems that we could not resolve on our own. Struggles that we could not resolve on our own. Addictions that we could not resolve on our own. And it's not done with the gospel of fruity pebbles. It's done with the gospel wit grit. Amen? It means to resolve. It means strength of character. How many know that we're called to have strength of character? What else does it mean? Backbone. God needs Christians with some backbone. Do you have backbone? Toughness. See, if you look at what's being 
presented in the churches right now. You don't have a gospel with backbone. You got a, a snowflake gospel. You got a jelly bag, gummy bear gospel, fruit loops gospel. You got everything but what is actually going to help this messed up day and age that we live in with these trials and tribulations that we're going to live in. We need a gospel with grit. Now you got some folks that got wit and you got some folks that got grit, but they don't got no gospel or they got the gospel with wit, but they don't got no grit. Amen. And you got some people with the gospel and they got grit, but they don't got no wit. Amen. They're running around like ogres and, and uh, bashing and, and you need wit with the grit. Amen. And if you don't have the gospel behind the wit and grit, then you don't got nothing. nothing. Warnings are confirmation that we are chosen when they run into danger. Who is they? They can be anyone. See, when I preach a sermon, God gives me prophetic sermons. Now, I am nowhere going to stand and say that I'm a prophet, but I'm not going to stand here and pretend like God is not speaking prophetically through me because I'm watching it happen. I can't make it happen. I can't teach you how to make it happen. No one taught me how to make it happen, but it happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've watched God speak through me to warn people, and I've watched that they did not heed to my warning, and I've watched the danger take place and it, I knew that the warning was prophetic someone said in uh, elaborate I don't understand pastor what are you talking about there was a time where I told someone they had this personal struggle and they had a cell phone and I told them get rid of your cell phone and that cell phone was causing them to stumble the Bible says if you're right I offend you pluck it out if your right hand offends you, cut it out. Now, am I saying that you should go and take a hacksaw and cut off your right hand or go see the ophthalmologist and scoop out your right eye? No, I'm saying whatever it is that's causing you to be tempted to sin, that is what you need to get rid of. And so I told this individual that they need to get rid of their cell phone, right? Now, I just warned them, uh, not even knowing that God may have been speaking prophetically through me, I just warned them of what God told me to say, and that's what I said. They did not listen to that prophetic warning. And so what happened is they were going down uh, the street, and they had the cell phone not listening to the warning, and they got robbed gunpoint right after I told them to get rid of the cell phone. And what did they get robbed for? Their wallet? No. Their shoes? No. Coat? No. They got robbed for their cell phone. The same thing that was causing them to sin told them to get rid of it. Didn't listen to the warning and they got robbed at gunpoint. Almost costed them their life. And then they came back shamefully not wanting to tell me this story. See, a lot of times we'll warn people and they won't tell us the consequences that happen by them not listening to that warning. Most people won't tell you that. They're not going to tell you. Who wants to say, oh, you know, you were right. I should have listened to you. Most people have too much pride to ever come and say something like that. Amen. That is just one of many, many examples. There are sermons that I've preached that had warnings in the sermons and, and people didn't listen to them. And I've watched things happen as consequences. Amen. And all that is, is that is a confirmation for that person who hears the warning to know that the person who's doing the warning is chosen by God. And the same thing happens with you. God is going to speak through you prophetically. God is going to speak through you to warn other people around you that are doing things that they should not be doing. And when they don't listen to you and things happen to them, that is God's stamp of approval on you. That is evidence that you are anointed and chosen by God. Now, don't we hope that people are going to listen to that warning? How many of you know when you have a gospel with grit, you're going to warn people? You're going to warn them. In Acts 27, verses 10, it says, And said unto them, Sirs, this is Apostle Paul speaking. Do you see the respect that he's given to the people that he's getting ready to warn? He addresses them as sirs. doesn't say dude, home skillet, home slice, home boy. He doesn't say any of that. He says sirs. 
How many of you know that if you have a gospel with grit, you've got to respect one another? God operates in order and within respect. And so if you lose that respect, you lose the order that God has given us to have gospel with grit. And said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt. How many want to go through hurt? And much damage. What is that? That is a warning. He is warning these folks that, look, if you continue with this voyage, if you continue on this direction, if you continue with this relationship, if you continue with this person, I am warning you that this voyage that you're getting ready to bark on, it's going to be with hurt. And you are going to have damage. Amen? And this is what he's doing right now. He's warning them. And he's saying, not only the landing of the ship, but also of our lives. So not only are you going to destroy the ship, you're going to destroy what you have, but it's going to cost you your life. See, when God speaks to us prophetically and God uses an anointed man of God to warn us or to guide us and we don't listen to it, and then all this damage happens and all this hurt happens, how many of you know that's the foolish thing? God warns us because he loves us. He cares about us. Just like Apostle Paul did. He, he cared about these people. But God needed to show these people that he was God's chosen, that he was God's anointed. They didn't believe it. How do I know they didn't believe it? Look at what happens. He said, and I said to them, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt. And much damage, not only for the landing of the ship, but also for the lives. Nevertheless, the centurions believed the master and the owner of the ship. See, they didn't listen to Apostle Paul because of his position that he was in. He was in a lower position, so they disrespected him. They disregarded him, and they listened to who? The master. The owner of the ship. They thought because he was the master, because he had a worldly position, that he was big boss and in charge, that we need to listen to him. How many folks are like that in this day and age? And how many folks are surrounded with churches and pastors where they don't get no warnings? The only prophet, prophecy they get is I see you married happy with a white picket fence and I see you a millionaire and God's going to use you speaking before millions of people. And it's the same lame prophecy every time because they're not hearing from God. They're not being used by God. A real prophet of God is going to warn folks. And a Christian, the gospel is good news. That is what the gospel means. But if you give someone only good news without wit and grit, it ain't going to help them. And look what happened. Acts 27, 20, and when neither sun nor stars and many days appeared. In other words, because they didn't listen to God's warning, they were in utter darkness. And if you could understand how horrifying it is to be trapped in the middle of an ocean, in the middle of even a lake, even if it was a river in pure darkness, you don't have no sun, you don't have no moon, you don't have no stars, you don't see anything, you're in pure darkness, and that's what happens when we don't listen to the warning of God. Saul thought he could do his own thing, and he didn't even know that the Holy Spirit left him. That's what the Bible says, that God's Spirit left him. It says the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit left him. And then it says right after that, that Saul didn't even know it. And when neither sun nor star any days appeared, no small temptation, no small storm, lay on us all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They actually gave up on the idea that they were even going to survive. Here, folks, people are not going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to your warnings. Still warn them. Warn them anyways. Warn them anyways. But they're not going to listen to you. 
Don't be deceived. Oh, pastor, I warned them. They didn't listen to me. <gasps> really? I didn't know. I thought everyone was going to listen to the word of God. They didn't listen to Jesus. Jesus walked on water and they didn't listen. I can't walk on water. I can't even ride a jet ski without falling off. And I know if they ain't listening to Jesus, they ain't listening to me. Doesn't matter. I'm not here for that. I'm here to preach the gospel with grit. Our wit does not come from worldly education. Oh, pastor, I, I want to tell you that you're not qualified to preach the gospel because you don't have a Ph.D. in our, our college. Our Ashland Theological Seminary is going to equip you and qualify you that through sitting down in a class and being taught like a robot and saying exactly what we believe and not listening from God, you can graduate with a Ph.D., be a fornicator, a crackhead. You could be a criminal, rob banks, beat your wife, and get your Ph.D. from seminary, but not have nothing from God. Amen. Our wit does not come from worldly education, but current, I want you to hear this, it comes from current revelation. Amen. How many you know as Christians, we're going to encounter a lot of people that are caught up in sin? And sin is going to cause the perfect storm in their life, and they're going to have no hope. They're going to have nowhere to turn to, they're going to be broken. Those are the folks that God wants us to share the gospel with. The folks that have been broken, the folks that have been shipwrecked, the folks that have been beaten down to the ground and stomped on, the folks that have been rejected, disrespected, those are the folks that are going to be humble enough to want the gospel with grit. Acts 27, 21. I love Apostle Paul. So here Apostle Paul is, he warned these folks. He said, look, I'm telling you, don't get on the ship. Don't do this voyage. It's not now. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And they didn't listen to him. Went on the ship and they, they, they thought they were going to die. And look at what it says. I, I, I really appreciate Apostle Paul. He said in Acts 27, uh, it said, but after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. See, in other words, he was marinating. He told them, don't do it. They did it. All hell's breaking loose. Did he jump in right away and try to save them or jump in right away and hold their hand? and pit? No. He just kind of sat back. You want to do your own thing? No problem. When you call me, I'm not answering. When you knock, I'm not opening. You wanted to do your own thing, do it. Look at, look at this. You see this? But after long abstinence. Now this abstinence is talking about eating. But he wasn't holding up a conversation with them. He let them marinate in it. He sat back and watched them disobey him, do their own thing. They know better, can't be told what to do. And he just sat back. I could see him sitting back. Look at you. Oh, what are we going to do? Oh, man, we're not going to live anymore. Should have listened to Paul. And he's just sitting back a long time. He was probably loving it. Loving it! Probably, he probably made, like, I could see, he probably set up camp in the corner, made a little chair, kicked back, just sucking it all in. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, see how he went with respect? You didn't listen to me? You know it all, sirs? You should have hearkened unto me. Man, how sweet was that? Amen. In other words, I told you so. I told you so. You didn't listen. You should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. Basically saying you should have never left from where you were at. You should have stayed put. 
You were in a good place. You left your place like the devil, and then all hell break loose, and now you're crying. And to have gained this harm and loss. Look at them. You can't see them. You can't appreciate it, but they're scared. In Acts 27, 22, it says, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. See, as Christians, sometimes we, it's called tough love. You have to allow folks to suffer a little bit. I'm not saying we can't have compassion. Yeah, have compassion. Paul let these folks, he said a long while went by. He let them, you, you have to let folks see that when they don't do the right thing, let them enjoy the consequences of that. Because that's the only way any of us are going to learn. And he said, now I exhort you, which means to encourage you, to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. So in other words, God is going to spare your life. Don't worry, you're not going to die. God's going to save you out of this. You're going to lose the ship. You're going to lose all the materialism. You're going to suffer a loss. There's going to be some consequences, but your life is going to be spared. You're going to lose everything that you had, everything that you disobeyed God with to this point. It's all gone. You're going to be set back in life, but you're going to live. You can lick your wounds, get up. I'm talking about gospel wit grit. For there stood by me this night the angel of God. He didn't say this, this night I, I pulled out my theology book. I called my Ph.D. professor on the phone. And he explained to me. No, an angel from God. An angel from God. Talk to him. He said, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whose I serve. In other words, he got current spiritual revelation, and that's what we need, folks. We need to be connected to God. We need to have a relationship with God. We need to hear from God so that we can currently give folks gospel with grant. Amen? Amen. In order for you to deliver the gospel with grit, you got to first get it for yourself. Before you try plucking out the, the splinter in your brother's eye first, get it in your own eye. You can put it together yourself first. Right? I want to say, uh, not last week, yeah, last week, me and my wife, we were at uh, uh, Strongsville Mall, and we were, we were up at the food court, and we were walking by, and it's like, um, it's real interesting when you walk by the food court. You got those samplers. Right? And if you circle long enough, you don't even got to get a meal. You just circle three, four times, and those folks, folks are pushing them samples. Right? So we walk by. I already know my wife wants to go to the, uh, I think it's the Sakio, the, the Japanese one where they cook it in front of you. Right? So I'm listening to these samples. We, we go to Sakio, we get the food, we sit down, and I'm, I'm, I'm right in between the, uh, the, uh, the Thai place and the Sakio place. I'm right in between the, the, the Chinese place and the Japanese place. I'm, my table's in the middle, and I'm watching them. And I'm looking at the difference between the two of them giving out the samples. On the one side, to the right, you got the Japanese lady. She's out there with her little teriyaki samples. She's like, sample. Like, she don't care at all about her job. You can tell. She don't care if you get a sample. She don't care if you go to Mr. Heroes. She don't care what you do. She's just holding up there. She's looking at her cell phone. Sample. Don't even care, right? That's her. And then I look over at the orange chicken guy. The orange chicken guy, he's like quoting Bible verse. He's like, $5.99, orange chicken, get it now. He's infringing on the Japanese line, trying to give samples to the other people. Not even in the line, he's, he's crossing boundaries. Orange chicken, orange chicken, best chicken in town, orange chicken. He's just going off. He's going on and on. And I thought to myself, isn't that a comparison of Christians? You got some gospel with grit, the orange chicken guy, and then you just got some gospel 
right? It ain't wit or grit. Talking about teriyaki, teriyaki. I thought to myself, if I were to have to hire one of the two people, I would. Oh, that. And now here's the thing: the orange chicken guy couldn't speak English to save his life. He couldn't speak not one lick of English, but he was more effective. Way more effective. He was drawing a crowd. Why? Because they like that that uh, that sake oil because they cook it in front of you. It's fresh. They cook it right there. The orange chicken, only sweet Jesus knows how long that orange chicken's been sitting there. You know, you might have to go to Metro afterwards. You don't know. So it takes a, a pusher. This man was pushing this orange chicken. And I thought to myself, that's how we ought to be with the gospel. And we have to have gospel with grit. We should, when we're preaching the word of God, we need to have passion. We need to be confident about what we're talking about. We don't have to pretend like we know it all. But do you believe in that what you're saying? When we keep serving Jesus, we will eventually escape whatever the devil tries to put us in. Look, the devil's going to try to put you in some stuff. Right? He's going to try to tempt you. He's going to try to ensnare you. He's going to try to redirect you. Guess what? If you keep going to church, you keep reading your Bible, you keep praying, you keep seeking God, it doesn't matter if every horde in hell tries to attack you. If you keep serving Jesus, you will eventually get out of it. You will eventually escape. Didn't say it's not going to be easy. Didn't say it's not going to be a battle. Didn't say it's going to be a struggle. I'm saying you will eventually escape it. Why? Because the Bible says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Who's in the world? The devil and all his demons. And they don't hold a candle to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Acts 28, it says, and when they were escaped, you see that? Disobeyed the man of God, did their own thing, went on their own voyage, tried to do a fantastic voyage, didn't end up so fantastic, but eventually they escaped. Amen? Why did they escape? Because they listened to the man of God. And the man of God, why was he a man of God? Because he was hearing from God. It says, and when they were escaped, they knew that the island was called Militia and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. In other words, they had, they were hospitable. They when they came there, they 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 treated them kind. They went all out of their way. They prepared a fire for them. It says, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire, and they received every one of us because of the present rain and because of the cold. Why was Apostle Paul put in this imprisonment? Why was he forced to go on the ship? He was a man that was in control. He was a man of authority. And then because that he received the gospel, he had to go through some grit. That's why he was in this situation in the first place. He was preaching the gospel with cost. How many know it's going to cost you to be used by God? It's going to cost you. And anyone that presents to you anything other than that is not given the gospel with grit. They're giving another gospel. Part of preaching the gospel is being attacked by the enemy. I want you to hear that. Part of preaching the gospel is being attacked by the enemy. The enemy hates that you're going to share good news with people. The enemy wants to enslave people, imprison them, bind them with addictions, bind them with curses, and he can't stand if we're going to preach the gospel. And he will attack you. Now, if you ain't preaching nothing, you ain't living nothing, don't worry. He, he's not threatened by you. He's going to leave you alone. You don't got nothing to worry about. Just enjoy your gospel with Fruit Loops. Oh, bro.
Brooklyn Christian Church, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed old brooklyn christian church